All right, Ruth chapter 4, our last chapter in the book of Ruth. Father God, we praise you. What an awesome, holy God you are. Lord, I pray that as you hear the praise of your people, this family, that Lord, we continue to remind each other that is in the adversity in life that we see best our Redeemer. That the gospel shines brightest in the darkest night. So Lord, I pray now as we end this, this story of redemption, Help us to experience it more and brighter each day. In Jesus' name, amen. Ruth chapter 4, uh, this is the final chapter in the story of redemption. And what a beautiful, beautiful book Ruth is. It is a story of redemption. It's a story of deliverance. There's a, a whole lot in this little story. And if you remember, uh, at the very beginning of this, uh, You see the prodigal family. Amalek and and, and his family leave the house of blessings, Bethlehem, the house of bread, and they they become that prodigal family and they go down to Moab, which is the garbage can of life. And so many times, we leave the place of blessing to go to the place where we, we cry out to God, but you know what? We need to put ourselves in a position so we can be blessed, instead of running the other way. And so we saw this family as they progressed. Uh, the, the, the father uh, uh, had, the think, had the strength of, of a king in his own mind. He had two sons. Anybody remember what their names were? Sickly and worthless. I mean, you know, I know some of those guys. And they all go down. They take their families down, and they die. And it leaves Naomi and her two daughter-in-laws well the story goes in about chapter two one of the daughter-in-laws decides that she will stay in Moab of course that was where she was from and Ruth returns and if you remember the wonderful words of Ruth I will go back with you your God will be your my God your family my family your land my land and where you go I go and I will be there until I perish only death shall separate us we hear those words in wedding ceremonies quite often but, but the reality was that she took hold of the one true God. And so we saw this story progress, and there was a wonderful hero in the story that we were introduced to back in the last chapter, and his name was what? Anybody remember, church? Boaz. Remember, Boaz was a spiritual man. Boaz was a good-looking man. Boaz was a wealthy man. And for all the young girls in the church, what does that spell? That spell husband, Okay? If he ain't got it, don't fool with him. If he ain't got it, leave him alone. Because remember, Boaz had some cousins that we put up on the screen. And they were kind of worthless. And if you marry one of those, you get to see Brother Rick quite often because you'll be in counseling. And when I get to where I can't deal with you no more, I'll pass you off to Renee. And she'll charge you to listen to the same thing I just told you. Okay? You married some of the cousins. You didn't wait on your Boaz. So we saw this wonderful person. Now Boaz wasn't just a good man. Boaz is the picture of Christ. He is that redeemer. And so we see this beautiful picture as Naomi has a a big dream for Ruth. How many of you have big dreams for your children? Anybody in here? I have big dreams for my family. I want them to do well. I want them to go beyond what they can think or imagine. And the only way they can do that is to put their faith and trust into a holy God. And so when I look at Max, I just see wonderful things. When I look at Stella, I see wonderful things. And the only way they can do that is to experience the wonderful, loving Savior. And so I have big dreams. Naomi had big dreams for Ruth. If you remember in the story, Boaz had put a hedge of protection around Ruth as she was gleaning in the fields. Remember, the law said that you had to leave the corners of the field so strangers and foreigners and travelers through could go and and glean the corners so they would have... You know, don't we have an awesome God that He takes care of people that don't know how to take care of themselves? I mean, aren't you glad? And so, but, but Boaz went a little further. He said... To Ruth, he said, listen, you stay here with my young maids and glean in these fields. My young men will take care of you. And not only that, but he then put grain in her bags. How many of y'all believe that we worship and serve a God of abundance? Anybody in here? I totally believe that. I believe that sometimes we 
only associate abundance with money, but abundance is everything in life. Most of us in this room have been blessed in abundance. And so that's the story we see of Boaz and Ruth. And so Naomi now, she cooks up this plan. Remember last chapter, she said, listen, you need to go down to the threshing floor, but before you go, you need to get all ready. There's a, there's a, 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 a song, that, it's a really old gospel song, it's called The Getting Ready Room. I don't, some of you may have heard it. It's, it's old. If you go back into some of these old churches where they got blue back hymnals, you'll find, no, it's, it's called a dressing up room, the dressing up room. And, and that's the story in that song is that we need to get ready to go meet our Savior. We need to dress up. We need to, to get anointed. We need to get ready and we need to get where we're supposed to go. And that's what Ruth is going to do. She's going to go down to the threshing floor. And that's kind of where we're going to pick up because that's where we left off. She's going to act on the plan that Naomi has for her, that big vision to, to, to come into the Redeemer's life. And his name is Boaz. Boaz is at the threshing floor, and he's, he's doing what they do at that time of year. It is a time of testing for Ruth. Have you ever had a time of testing? If you have, just say amen. Have you ever had a time where you had to be refined just a little bit? Where, where, where some rough edges had to be knocked off of you? When Ben and Freddie and these old guys you see with all these scars, that's just God's way of knocking some rough edges off. He had to get most of Ben's hair, but he got, he got the edge knocked off. It's pretty rounded out now. And so, you know, the threshing floor is always the picture of that place where we go. Where, where, we, where we are always going to have to encounter that time of testing. And listen to me, if you've not encountered that time of testing in your Christian life, just wait on it, it's coming. It's coming. And when you get through it, you'll look back on it and you'll go, thank God for the threshing floor. It's that time of refinement, it's that time of separation. It was a naturally a time of separation, they would separate the chaff from the grain. But it's also in, in spiritual terms, it's that place where the genuineness of our faith being tested is like gold to God, being proven. It was also a time where you could find a place of rest. And that's what Naomi told Ruth, remember? When everybody settles down after he's eaten and, and he's relaxed, everybody goes to bed, go lay at his feet. And when he awakes, he will pull his cover over you. That's that symbolism of being drawn under the wing. You know, we live under the Father's wing, don't we? You know, Jesus said, I long to have taken you, the nation of Israel, like a mother chick takes her, her babies under her wings to protect you. That's what I long for, but you won't allow me to. And so we see this beautiful picture. We're going to move on from the threshing floor in just a moment. But I'll, I'll kind of end that thought with the words of David as he was going to make a sacrifice to God and he went to the threshing floor. This is after all his stupidity. Everybody just say stupidity. Have you ever committed some stupidity? David learned from his. I hope I've learned from some of mine. And when he got to the threshing floor to offer his sacrifice to God, the guy that owned the threshing floor said, I will give you the threshing floor so you can make your sacrifice, your offering. And King David said, no, you won't. I have learned not to take what doesn't belong to me and what doesn't cost me something I'll not offer to God. Listen, folks, everything in our life is going to cost us something. And it needs to. So this is that, that place. Ruth put it all in the hands of Boaz that night. She went down there trusting him to be her redeemer. She laid at her feet, at his feet. She placed herself in that best place. She waited the long night's wait. Some of you have been recently in that place where there was a long night of waiting. Can you imagine what must have gone through Ruth's mind as she lay at his feet? Boaz doesn't know she's there yet. And she's kind of thinking, what's going to happen when he realizes I'm here? Is he going to tell me to just leave, that he has nothing to do with me? It's kind of an anxious moment, isn't it? When I was about 14, I didn't believe that the Lord would let the world tarry long enough for me to get a driver's license. 
I thought, surely the world is going to end before I can get me a driver's license. And then when I got a little older and noticed girls, I thought, well, surely the Lord's going to call the church home before I can get me a girlfriend. <laughs> I mean, you know, we were limited in our thinking back in those days. It's that long waiting. If you're in that time of waiting right now, just remember this. God's not going to push you away no more than Boaz pushed Ruth away. The waiting is worth it, amen? We wait on God. It's that long night of waiting. Her redemption was near. Now in chapter 4, in the first two verses it says, Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. Behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city, uh, and they sat down. Now, if you remember when we left off in chapter 3, Boaz had agreed to redeem Ruth. And to redeem her meant that he had to marry her. He had to settle whatever was out there. He had to settle. But there was one mystery redeemer. He had to be the next of, in line, kin folks wise. Had to be a kinsman. But there was one that was before him. And so now Boaz, acting on that, goes down to the city. This is that close relative that he was speaking of. That first relative had the first option on redemption. The other man, you might say. Now if you're taking notes, just write this down. The other person here is the law. That's who this is. The law of God is who has first option on redemption for Ruth. Verses 3 and 4, we'll start to see it later. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling a parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here, in the presence of the elders of my people. And if you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one else besides you to redeem it. And I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Verse 6, then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. So we see here that there are only two ways of redemption. The one is by the law. And that's what really is happening here in verses 3 and 4. Is that the law was God's way of giving them their relationship to Him. That is the Redeemer that had first option was the law. But the law was limited. The law was limited. If God gave the law and you broke a single part of the law, were you not guilty of breaking all the law? How many of us could keep the law in our own strength? How many have ever told a lie before? Anybody in here? How many of you just kind of get great joy out of telling a good and every now and then just to make sure you stay in practice? (laughs) Hey, I like to make mine so obvious that nobody would believe it, but it just makes me feel like I'm staying in practice with it. Just like I love to see new people when they come in the church and I tell them I made all these cookies for Wednesday night and they go... I see the bag. I mean, I see the... What's this about? I didn't say I told good lies. I just said I told a lie. You see, the problem with the law, as redemption goes, and we'll see this over in the New Testament when we get there, is that the law was never able to save anybody. It just gave man God's design and a way of relating to Him. You know, until Jesus came, everybody was under the law that lived in the nation of Israel. They were under the law of God. And so, the first Redeemer was the law, but it was limited. The law could never save anyone. That's why you can't keep enough rules. You can't be good enough to earn your salvation. I know some really good people. But without Jesus, they're just as lost as they can be. 
One of the, one of the questions that, that young people ask, and Kimberly was, was no exception, and, it, and it was, it, I enjoy these conversations to have with these young people. If my life is supposed to be different, I, I don't know, wh- how does this look? Now what she was saying is this, I don't do anything bad yet. Thank God. Somebody just say thank God. But you know what? For some people, when they come to know Jesus, there's a really radical change. Amen? I've seen some people that were real rascals. Y'all know what I mean when I say rascals, right? Like Linda Ford. I mean, you know, just kind of ra- there. Couldn't help that, Linda. I'm sorry. I could have said Robert, but you were just too nice a target sitting right there. Don't make eye contact. Don't make eye contact. But I mean, you know, not everybody's life just changes a lot. Because it was never based on your goodness to start with. It's based on a relationship. And so, Boaz represents not the law, but he is the work of Christ. He represents the saving power of Jesus. Now, let me tell you, where the law is limited, there is no limitation with Jesus. Amen? Jesus is not limited in his saving power. So Boaz, as he is that redeemer, is not limited in any way at all. So we look at verse 5 and 6. Then the redeemer, I cannot redeem it for myself. The law could not. So from that standpoint, the law failed to be able to redeem Ruth. The law will fail to redeem you as well. You cannot keep enough rules. You cannot do enough good things. For you must raise up the name of the deceased, he said, and give that an inheritance. The law had no power to bring life to anything. The law still doesn't have power to bring life to anything. Can you imagine what the Jews must have thought when Jesus raised that first dead person when he called Lazarus forth or or when... Uh, on the day he was crucified, the, the graves broke open and they saw people walking around. Only Jesus can give life. And the law cannot. The law cannot set us free from the power nor the penalty of sin. For years and years and years, the Jews had to offer a sacrifice on the Day of Atonement to cover their sins. But just as soon as Daniel brought his family and his sacrifice and they cut that that young lamb's throat, and they drained the blood and they hung it over the wall. As soon as he was redeemed, covered in blood for the sins of his family, guess what happened the very next minute? Sin started to accumulate again. And so we see that the law was powerless to do anything when it comes to salvation. There's only one who can free us from the power of sin and the penalty of sin. And the law was never able to do that. Now, verse 7 through 10, we see the custom. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction. One drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders all and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought from the land of Naomi all that belong to Elimelech and all that belong to Chilion and Maelon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Maelon, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in its inheritance that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the the gate of his native place. So the sandal is off. The sandal came off just like the law came off of us when we come under grace. That was the exchange that took place. All of this has been working toward that moment when the law would do its perfect work. The law was to let us know what sin was and direct us toward Christ. Now if you would, turn to Colossians chapter 1. The Jews struggled with the law, trying to keep it. 
And then when Jesus came and delivered them from the law, they had a hard time getting rid of it. The law was perfect. The problem wasn't the law. The law was perfect. God gave it as a perfect set of rules. The problem was people. Have you ever looked in the mirror and realized that the biggest person that was a problem in your life was staring back at you? That's kind of the way it works. And so the law was not flawed. It's that the people were flawed. Now if you look at first. Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 13. He has delivered us, this being Jesus, from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. What the law was unable to do, Jesus is able to do. We find true and total redemption because He has delivered us from the darkness that comes with sin. He has transferred us into His kingdom and we have total redemption. If you remember, Boaz called, as was the custom, ten elders who were to be witnesses to this transaction. Now if you kind of follow that, that was the Ten Commandment law, if you will. The first law could not redeem. It only could point to Christ. The second, Boaz, is that typical that 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 symbol of faith in Christ that has come that is no longer under the supervision of the law now turn to Galatians with me this is kind of hard easier to understand in the New Testament Galatians chapter 3 so we have Boaz who is now redeeming, fully redeeming Ruth because the first option, the law, could not redeem her. It could only execute what God had commanded. And so we now see in Galatians chapter 3 more or less an explanation of that whole transaction. Look at verse 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive under what? The law. The law is what allowed Ruth to lay herself at the feet of Boaz. The law is what allowed her to glean in the fields of Boaz. The law was what Boaz used to put a hedge of protection around Ruth, also to bless her with an abundance. But the law could only get the two together. That was as far as it went. So now with the law, as a witness, Boaz does what the law cannot do. And Galatians tells us that before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. That coming faith is that kinsman redeemer known as Jesus. It is hard for people to separate themselves from the law. We still want to live under the law, but we don't live under the law. We live under what, church? We live under grace. We do not live under the law. Now, if you'll continue to read verse 24, so then the law was our guardian until Christ came. The law was our babysitter, our overwatch, until Christ could come in order that we might be justified by faith. That word justified is just another way of saying the law could never save us, nor could it redeem us. Only Jesus can do that. And so, we were justified by faith, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under what? The the law. Can it get any clearer than that? are, Are we under the law? No. What part of the law do you... If you put yourself under the law, then that means you've got to be able to keep all the law. Nobody's ever been able to keep all the law. That's the reason Jesus came was to fulfill the law, to make the law obsolete, to do as this says, when faith comes, then we're no longer under the protection, the guardianship of the law. We're under the age of grace. And that's what's experienced here. Verses 13, 11 through 13, is that we're finally free. 
we're finally free in that new relationship that brings blessings. How many of you have struggled with trying to be good enough to suit Jesus when really what you just had to do was go sit at the feet of Jesus and ask for forgiveness for your foolishness sometimes? You see, that's grace. And this beautiful picture, this new relationship that Ruth has, she didn't just get redeemed, she became a wife to Boaz. Now, just turn on over to Ephesians. It would have been enough for me, Sue, I believe, had Jesus just, had Boaz rather just simply redeemed my land and given me freedom. I believe that would have been enough, don't you? I mean, I'd have been, thank you, Boaz, I appreciate that. But you see, it wasn't that. He, he also made her a wife. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. This is, this, is the, this is the verses in the Bible that women love the most. And maybe, I don't know. Are y'all there? Ephesians chapter 5. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. It, it, isn't that the way it's supposed to be? That we are to be godly leaders in our home? All the men ought to be saying amen. amen. Listen, we're to be godly leaders in our home. Now as the church submits to Christ, so now also wives submit in everything to their own husband. This is the picture of Boaz and Ruth. This is the picture of Christ and the church. Now look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved what? Church. Let me tell you something. When you get a husband that loves you like Jesus loves the church, you got a church, you got a husband that loves you with everything he has. And is willing to give his life for you. Remember Boaz was a spiritual man. He was a wealthy man. He was a godly man. And that spells what? That spells husband. This is the picture of what would be the relationship between Christ and the church. There is no better bridegroom than Jesus. Amen? Amen? And we ought to be a prepared bride. Remember what Naomi told Ruth? Get yourself down to the threshing floor. And when you get down there, you be prepared to trust Him. And you put yourself at His feet. Because in the morning, He's going to do for you what's got to be done. That's the work of redemption. And so as we read on, I, I love this. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her that He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water and the Word so that He might present the church to Himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. That is the picture of redemption. Verse 28, In the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, He who loves his wife loves as himself. Now, in this beautiful story of Ruth and Boaz, redemption was completely redeemed. She didn't just get set free, but she became his bride. And and, and if if you go back and read the last couple of verses, Naomi had been, I mean, Ruth had been barren. But guess what happened when she married Boaz? She had children. She had children. Blessings came. The one who gives life continues to give life. Beautiful story of Ruth. It is a story of redemption. It is the story of the church in Christ. It is the story of the believer. And so we're thankful tonight that we get to see this splendid picture of redemption.